Hello and welcome back to another video. So today I'm going to be reviewing Fractal Design's brand new Meshify 2 Compact. And I've already put out a full step-by-step -step PC build guide in this case, and you'll find a link to that video in the description. So the Meshify 2 Compact is a direct replacement for Fractal's very popular Meshify C. It brings a whole host of improvements and modern features carried over from their very popular Meshify 2. And I've done a full review of that case and was really impressed with it. So in this review, I'm going to be running you through the main case features. I've also done quite a bit of detailed thermal testing in this case, both with an AIO and with an air cooler. So one, I'm going to be telling you should you get this case, and two, if you should, how you should build on it to get the most from the case. Okay, so the Meshify 2 Compact is available in three colours. There's black, there's white, and there's grey. The black version is available in three different versions. So you've got a one with a solid panel at the front, and there's also two versions with a temper glass panel, one with a dark tint and one with a light tint. And the one I've used in the build guide had the light tint in case you were wondering. The white version is only available in one version, and that is with a clear temper glass panel, while the grey version has a light tint on the temper glass. MSRP in the United Kingdom is $96.99 for all versions apart from the black version with the solid panel at the front which is a little bit cheaper at $87.99. So starting off with the front panel, Fractal have stuck with the same angular mesh as used in its other cases. The mesh component of the front panel is actually now on a door similar to found in the Meshify 2. So if you pull the Fractal logo out and to the right the mesh component is on hinges and this opens up giving you access to the front fans. To remove the mesh component all you need to do is simply pull it forward. Looking at the back of the front panel you'll notice there's also a nylon dust filter which can be removed by pulling upwards. And one of the nice things that Fractal Design are doing here is they're giving you a choice of how you use this case. If airflow is more important to you you can run with just the mesh panel on the front. If keeping your case free from dust is more important, you can run with both the mesh and the dust filter at the front. And this is great that you're able to make this choice. Um, other case manufacturers make this decision for you by shipping a case with just a mesh panel and no filters. So it's great that you can decide how you want to use this case. The rest of the front panel can simply be pulled off from the front. So it's nice to see that there's no wires attached to the front panel as the front I.O. is now built directly into the case chassis. Down at the bottom of the case we've got another nylon full length dust filter which can simply be pulled out from the front. Removing the side panels is fairly straightforward. There's a little notch at the rear of the case which you simply pull outwards and then the panel can be lifted away. And I think this bolt free top latching mechanism that Fractal Design used on their side panels is among the best I've found in any case. There's absolutely no difficulty at all getting these panels on and off. The build quality is excellent and it feels really reliable. Moving up to the top of the case and starting with the front I.O. we've got two USB 3.0 type A ports, we've got a USB 3.1 Gen 2 type C port with fast charging, we've got a power button, reset button and then we've got separate headphone and microphone jacks. The top panel has a large steel mesh panel and can be removed by simply lifting upwards. Below this we've got another nylon dust filter which can be removed by sliding backwards and lifting upwards. On the top of the case we've got a removable fan stroke radiator bracket which is held on by two screws at the front. Once these have been removed the top bracket can simply be lifted away. So having this removable fan stroke radiator bracket at the top offers two main advantages. The first is it's much easier to mount your radiator and fans on the top of this bracket on a flat table and then bring them to the case and simply set them in place than it is to try and do it directly in the case. The other big advantage for you is that actually you're going to have great access to this case during the build without the top panel in place. So although this is the compact version of the Meshify 2, you can actually fit an awful lot of hardware into the case. For motherboards it supports motherboards up to ATX, it will support CPU coolers up to a maximum height of 169mm, Looking at the maximum length for the GPU, it really depends on what you're going to mount at the front. 
If you're not going to have any fans or radiators at the front, GPUs up to 360 millimeters are supported, although I'm not sure why you wouldn't have any fans or radiators at the front. With just fans at the front, a GPU length up to 341 millimeters is supported, and with a standard thickness radiator and fans at the front, a GPU up to 305 millimeters is supported. The case will support up to seven case fans and comes with three fans pre-installed. They're the Dynamic X2 fans and you get two 140mm fans at the front and a 120mm fan included at the rear. At the front of the case you can mount either two 140mm fans or three 120mm fans. At the top of the case it's two 140mm or two 120mm fans. At the rear of the case you can mount a 120mm fan. While at the bottom of the case if you go ahead and remove the hard drive cage you can mount a 120mm fan. Looking at radiator support, at the front of the case you can fit either a 360mm or 280mm radiator. Again, just be careful with your length of GPU if you're planning on using a front mounted radiator. At the top of the case you can fit up to a 240mm radiator, while you can fit a 120mm radiator at the rear or down at the bottom. And again, mounting one down at the bottom is going to require removal of the hard drive cage. So another really nice feature of this case is the two-part removable cover for the radiator cutout at the front of this case. So Fractal Design have got this cover just right. If you want to just install fans down to the bottom of the case, you can move part of this bracket. And that's going to mean things are still going to look really tidy. If you want to install a thick radiator and fans, you can remove both parts of this bracket. And in other case manufacturers, either they don't include a cover, or they include a cover that if you want to just install fans, you have to remove the whole thing. And the problem with this is that you can then see all the cables down at the bottom of the case through this massive cutout. So well done to Fractal for including this two-part bracket. So whatever you decide to do in this case, it's going to look nice and tidy. Moving to the rear of the case, we can see we've got seven horizontal PCIe expansion slot covers. Down below this, we've got a removable bracket for the power supply. This is designed to be mounted to your power supply outside the case, and then you can simply slide your power supply directly in from the back of the case, securing it with the two thumb screws. And this is much easier than having to insert your power supply in from the side and slide it backwards. Moving into the rear of the case, all the cutouts look to be in the right places, and it's great to see that they've all got rubber grommets on them. You shouldn't have any trouble managing cables in the back of this case with the included Velcro straps. What's really nice to see is that Fractal have included these on both sides of the case, as most manufacturers will only include Velcro straps over to the left-hand side. As well as Velcro straps, we've got some cable alignment clips over to the left-hand side, and we've got plenty of cable tie points with cable ties included in the accessory box. Over to the right hand side we have got two dedicated two and a half inch drive mounts. To remove the bracket all you need to do is loosen the thumb screw at the top and then it can be simply be lifted upwards. You have the option of mounting your two and a half inch SSDs in the rear of the case or if you prefer you can move these brackets into the main compartment and mount your SSDs on top of the power supply shroud. If you want to do both you can purchase additional brackets from Fractal. Down at the bottom of the case we've got a hard drive cage where you can mount two 2.5 inch or 3.5 inch drives. You can vary the position of the hard drive cage. All you need to do is loosen the four screws at the bottom and then you can slide the hard drive cage from left to right. Then tighten up the screws again in the position you want to keep it in. Alternatively you can remove the hard drive cage. All you need to do is to fully loosen the four screws at the bottom and then the hard drive cage can be removed via the radiator cutout. The reason you may want to remove the hard drive cage if you're not planning on using it is it's going to give you much more room down the bottom of the case for your power supply cables. The other thing it's going to let you do is mount an intake fan at the bottom of the case or you can actually get an additional multi-bracket from Fractal and mount a three and a half inch drive down the bottom of the case. The other use for these optional multi-brackets which you can purchase from Fractal is you can actually mount two 3.5 inch drives on the top of the case on that fan stroke radiator bracket. So just before I come on and give you the thermal testing results, in case you haven't seen my build guide, I want to give you a run through the original build because it was slightly different than the system I've got in front of me today. So we had the i9 10850K being cooled by Fractal Design Celsius Plus S24 Prisma and we had the radiator mounted at the top as exhaust. For the graphics card, I had the ROG Strix 3080, 
and I didn't actually add any additional case fans into the build, sticking with the included fans in their original location, which was the two 140mm at the front set to intake, and the single 120mm fan at the rear as an exhaust. So you can see our temperatures and noise levels were fairly reasonable. Um, while the PC was at idle, while it was being used for gaming, and during a fairly extreme test, the IDA64 stability test. So the first thing I wanted to test was removing the front and top dust filters and see did that make any difference to the temperatures. So with the dust filters removed, the CPU temperature both at idle and under load came down by one degree, while the GPU temperature under load came down by one degree. So as you'd expect, removing the dust filters, you will get some improvement in temperatures, but the improvement in temperatures is actually really small. And this tells me that the dust filters that Fractal have included with this case are of pretty good quality. So personally, it's up to you, but I would probably leave them in, given you're only getting a very small benefit in temperatures. The next thing I wanted to test was adding that bottom intake fan, and in particular, I was interested in the GPU temperatures. So with that bottom intake fan, there was no difference to the temperatures at idle, while the CPU temperature under load went up by one degree, while the GPU temperatures under load came down by two degrees. And this was associated with two decibels of extra noise under load. So the bottom intake fan didn't really bring any significant benefit in terms of temperatures. It brought more noise, it's gonna cost you money, you're gonna have to remove your hard drive cage, and the biggest sacrifice for me is I had to remove my cable extensions to allow me to fit it in, so it significantly affected the aesthetics of the build. So factoring all this in, I can't recommend installing a bottom intake fan. The next thing I wanted to test was how good are the included case fans. So what I did was I replaced them with the Noctia NFS12A fans, which are my standard testing fan. It is important to note that the included case fans had three pin connectors, so I ran those using the standard motherboard DC fan curves. The Noctia fans I used had four pin connectors, so I used the standard PWM fan curves. The other important thing to note, this wasn't a complete like-by-like -like comparison because the included case fans were 140mm fans at the front and I had replaced them with 120mm fans. So with the Noctia fans, the CPU idled one degree hotter and was four degrees hotter under load. The GPU was two degrees hotter at idle, but two degrees cooler under load. It was a different story with the noise levels, as the noise levels at idle were five decibels louder with the Noctia fans, while under load they were actually one decibel louder with the Noctia fans. So I think this shows that the included case fans are of good quality and they do a great job when it comes to cooling. Maybe the only slight issue is a slightly higher idle noise compared to the Noctia fans, but I think that's mainly due to the mode that we have to run them in. In DC mode, the fans will run at a higher speed than they will in a PWM mode at idle, and that explains the extra noise. The next thing I wanted to test was did three 120mm front intake fans work better than two? So I went ahead and added an extra Noctia fan down at the bottom. Looking at the temperatures, there was no difference to the idle temperatures while both the CPU and GPU temperatures came down by one degree under load. Looking at noise levels, there was no difference at idle while the noise went up by one decibel under load. So having that extra 120 millimeter intake fan down at the bottom at the front was gonna drop your temperatures by one degree under load, but bring your noise levels up by one decibel. And given the cost of an extra fan, for me, I don't think that's worth it. The next thing I wanted to test was did moving the radiator to the front and having it as an intake give us better temperatures than having the radiator at the top as an exhaust. The only slight problem I had with this was that we couldn't actually fit the radiator at the front with our 3080. So what I did, I swapped the 3080 out for the 3060 Ti, reran the temperatures, and then moved the radiator to the front. The two 140 millimeter fans that were at the front, I put at the top as exhaust, and then ran the test again. So as we were now having cooler air moving through our radiator, we would expect our CPU temperatures to come down, and they did. Um, at idle, the CPU temperatures came down by four degrees, while under load, they came down by six degrees. The downside of having a radiator as an intake is you bring more hot air into the case, so your components in the case tend to heat up a little bit more, and that's what we found with our GPU. At idle, the temperatures went up by one degree, while under load, they went up by three degrees. 
We did, however, find a significant saving in our noise levels with the noise at idle coming down by 2 decibels and the noise under load coming down by a whopping 6 decibels. So I think just looking at these results, your conclusion would be that your radiator is much better as a front intake because your CPU temperatures are going to come down by much more than your GPU temperatures are going to go up. And as well, you're going to get a significant saving on your noise levels. But the big problem for me with having the radiator on the front was the aesthetics. I just did not think it looked as well as the radiator on the top. And that's for a number of reasons. The first thing was the tubes stretching across the GPU did not look well to me. The other thing I particularly like, if you're going to have a build where you don't use RGB on your case fans, I like to have RGB fans on the radiator at the top set to white. And that shines a lot of light into the case and lights all the components up. And you don't get that same effect with the radiator at the front. The next thing I wanted to test was did adding an additional intake fan down below the front intake radiator improve temperatures? In particular, I was interested in the GPU temperatures. So at idle, there was no difference to the CPU temperatures while the GPU temperatures increased by one degree. Under load, the CPU temperatures increased by one degree while the GPU temperatures came down by two degrees. Noise-wise, the additional fan brought two decibels of extra noise at idle while there was no difference to the noise levels under load. So overall, temperatures were slightly worse, there was slightly more noise, and there's going to be more cost to an additional fan. So this wouldn't be a configuration I would recommend. Next thing I wanted to do was test how good this case was for air cooling. So I swapped out our AIO for Noctua's NHD15, leaving our case fans in their stock configuration. So I did run into a bit of a problem here, and that was with the NHD15 installed, the front fan was preventing the side panel from closing. I could get the little clip over to the left hand side of the side panel closed but there was a little bit of a gap over to the right hand side and that front fan was putting pressure on the RAM. So the maximum height for CPU coolers in this case is 169mm and I would have thought our NHD15 would have fitted because its height is 165mm. Although we had no problem getting the heatsink to fit and the middle fan to fit, it was just the problem with the RAM itself was pushing the fan too far forward to allow it to fit. But because I'd gone to all the effort of installing the cooler, I decided to go ahead and run the thermal testing anyway. So I did leave the side panel on, but with that small gap on the top right hand side of it. So looking at our CPU temperatures, I was actually fairly surprised by the results. Comparing the air cooler to when we had our radiator on the top as an exhaust, the air cooler actually gave us better temperatures. CPU temperatures at idle were lower by three degrees with the air cooler, and one degree under load with the air cooler. It was a different story when we moved the AIO to the front, where the AIO beat the air cooler by one degree at idle and five degrees under load. Looking at the noise levels, the NHD15 was right in the middle between our two different AIO configurations. So I think this is the first time I've ever had the NHD15 outperform a 240 millimeter AIO. So this tells me this is a pretty good case for air cooling albeit you're not going to be able to go with the NHD15 in this case with this particular RAM. With some lower profile RAM, you may be able to get it to fit with that front fan in place. So I'm going to put a summary slide of all the different thermal configurations I've tested. So if you want to have a closer look at these, go ahead and pause your video. So now we reach the point in this review where I need to tell you, should you go out and buy this case? And to answer that question, we need to weigh up the pros and the cons. And as you've probably worked out so far in this review, this case has an awful lot going for it. But I think the biggest feature that this case has got going for it for me is build quality. And this case has some of the best build quality of any case that I have reviewed. And when you consider this case costs less than £100, I would not expect a case at this price point to offer this build quality or this level of options. The other important things to consider is I think we've got a great looking build. Both my original build with the high powered graphics card and the AIO and also the build I've got in front of me with a more reasonably sized graphics card and a larger killer. We also got great temperatures with both these builds and good noise levels. I think maybe the only slight negative or the only suggestion that I would have for improvement with this case is I would love them to include the fans with four pin connectors rather than three. But if that's my only suggestion for improvement, 
this tells you just how good this case is. So going back to answer my original question, should you get this case? The answer is most definitely yes. And given the price point, you're getting exceptional value for money. So hopefully you find this review useful. If you have, please hit the thumbs up button. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. And I'll see you in the next video.